So today I'm, I'm here to talk about, uh, I changed the title, sorry, the, the one of being my, my life as an African-American woman in, in physics. Um, I admit that when I was asked to come here, it was, it was a challenge to think about the talk. I'm used to giving research talks about my science. This is abstract, you know, this is facts and deliverables and I can show devices, I know what to do. I'm not used to talking about myself, <laughs> my background. Um, and so, you know, I thought, why am I being asked to give this talk? Well, the obvious answer is that I'm a, a double minority, right? I'm a, an African-American woman in the hard sciences. That's pretty rare. I think that the year I got my PhD, I was the only African-American woman in the country in, to get her PhD in physics that year. Um, so that's rare, but it didn't seem like quite enough. And I, I think that the reason I'm here is that I'm an African-American woman in physics who really likes her job. <laughs> I really, I'm really happy with my job um, and with my life and with some of the choices I've made. And it's important to me that you all have some of the same opportunities that I've had. Um, and you have the opportunity to choose jobs, make choices that are good for you so that you can have careers that you like, hopefully careers in the sciences, in math, which I think is a great place to work, <laughs> to have a career. Um, and that you can end up to jobs and lives that make you happy as well. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'm just going to you know, tell you something about myself. I, I don't have a lot to say. It'll be pretty short, and I'm looking forward to just opening up the floor to questions. Uh, so I'm just going to start by telling you where I am now, why, why I like where I am, something about my personal background. You've already heard the skeleton outline, what path I took to get my career trajectory, um, special challenges that I've thought of of being a woman or a minority um, in this field. And I'm just going to mix in advice and stories and some tangents and random stuff and just bear with me while I do that. <laughs> and ask me about more. If you want more detail, just ask me about it later and I'll be glad to fill in anything. Okay, so, so first let me tell you about where I am right now and what better place to start than my web page. <laughs> So I'm actually very proud of it. I just put it together a few weeks ago, so uh, I, I, it's not fancy, but I did it. Um, so <laughs> there's the URL um, uh, if you want more information about my research or, or what my group is doing right now, please feel free to just look that up. You know, my email address is on there. Uh, as you can see, it says at the very top, my research is on uh, transport and nanoscale systems. I'll say more about that in a minute. I have a big research group. I don't have a pointer, but you can, you can see it there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I'm fine. I, we don't know. It's, it's, I don't need a pointer. Not that sort of talk. Um, but there's my research group. Uh, I have uh, six graduate students and a postdoc and a couple undergrads working for me. We have a couple grants that supports all of them. I have a beautiful lab in the materials research building. It has red floors. Um, I should say that you know this is. I'll say later about making your own choices and doing things. This is one thing that it, I was able to design my own lab, and I thought, well, you know, I don't want a gray floor or a brown floor. I like red. I want something colorful and exciting. And the, uh, the woman who was helping me design the lab, you know, coming up with the colors and stuff, she was so excited. She said, it's going to be girly. <laughs> you know? And I said, that's good. You know, I want it to be how I want it. That's my contribution, red floors in my lab. So anyway, so, uh, so that's, my, uh, that's my research page. So, so what do I work on? Um, I, I can't tell you much about myself without telling you what I'm doing right now. So very, very briefly, um, I work on I study the fundament fundamental electronics of very small things. By very small, I mean like a billionth of a meter in diameter, right? Nanoscale objects. Uh, things like carbon nanotubes, which are little tubes of carbon that are, that are rolled up. Um, graphene, uh, superconductors, things that have zero resistance on the nanoscale. We make these things, we measure them. I've showed a little diagram. You know, mostly we just treat them as resistors, put a current, put a voltage on, measure the current, uh, make interesting devices. There is a picture of me when I was in grad school with one of our apparatus that gets things very, very cold. Um, this is all experimental science. It's officially called experimental condensed matter physics. Um, and I think it's a lot of fun. I enjoy the actual work of it. It's, it's sort of, to me, a cool topic, nanoscience, nanotechnology. I get to play around the lab. Um, I get to think about these things all the time. I'm interested in it. Uh, it's relevant to devices like ultra-small computers, like quantum devices. Um, this, is, this is something that I enjoy thinking about and doing and what I get to do all the time. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to give you a sense of what I do. You know, I'm faculty in academia. Of course, that's not the only thing that you can do with a math science degree. There's a lot of things you can do with a math science degree, and we can talk about those later. Um, I'm giving my 
perspective from an academic. Um, so you know, maybe you wonder, what do you do all day as, as faculty? Uh, here's, I've just given a list of what I might do on any given week. There's a whole lot of things that I, I teach. Um, I'm teaching my own course on nanoscience in the fall. I've taught you know, 400 students at a time in a big lecture on introductory e and uh, I, I do research with graduate students. I should mention that you know, I, I used to, in, in, as a graduate student myself and as a postdoc, I worked in a lab all the time. Now my graduate students work in the lab all the time and I watch them work all the time and pressure them to work more all the time. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I work with them, so I research with the students, I, I mentor the, stu the, under the graduate students and undergraduates on classes and courses and choices. Uh, I spend time writing grants, I, I read research articles to figure out what's going on in my field, to, to, uh, to get ideas for new experiments, I spend a lot of time writing papers when we have results, I review other people's grants and articles to give my opinion on them, I go to seminars, give talks, attend workshops, there's a lot of things here, as you can see, and you can pick any three of them. They're sort of a full-time job. <laughs> so um, it's, a very, it's a very varied job. And, uh, and like I said, I'm here because I like my job. Right? And I, I don't think this is a small thing. Uh, I, I challenge you to just go up to a, you know, sort of a random adult on the street and say, do you like your job? Right? I, I bet the answer will be, you know, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it, I, it, it's really, I find it, it's, it's hard to find people who really like what they do. I don't mean like the money or like the prestige, but just like the actual things that they do during the day. You know, there's never a day that I get up and just dread going to work. You know, there are days when I, I have a lot to do and I'm just rushing and worrying about how I'm going to get it all done, but I never don't want to do it. I mean, even grant writing, which everyone complains about, it's just that it takes a lot of time and we have other things to do. It's not that it's that boring or uninteresting. Um, I really, I like doing the things that I do. Um, so here's some of, the, some of the reasons why I like it. And I apologize for all the pictures of myself, but I don't know, it's about me, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> it's my only chance now. Um, so, so why do I like what I do? There's a huge variety of work. I just told you about all those different things. It's never boring, right? There's so many different things that I can focus on in any given day. I get to focus on the research and the teaching that's interesting to me. Intellectual stimulation, work your mind. You know, again, it's just, it's not boring. It's, I get to, to think about what I like to think about and to direct my work toward things I like to think about. Again, that's very rare. And if you continue in math and science, it's much easier to find jobs that allow you to do that. Right? If you get an advanced degree, even if you don't go on in academia, you can find jobs that allow you to think about things that are interesting for you. And that's a huge advantage in life, right? It's a big deal. Um, I'm, I'm pretty well paid. Uh, I, I, say, I put this here because I, I feel like there's a fallacy that if you're in academics, you're, you're poor, and you're not making a lot of money. Okay, it's true, I'm not making as much as bankers make, and bankers aren't making as much as they used to make, okay? So I actually have a pretty stable job right now, right? <laughs> compared to them. Um, but you know, I, I you have a nice house and you know, a fine car and I have everything I need and I get to travel. And if you look at most of your professors, they live pretty well. So um, you don't need to worry about having a decent life, especially if you have you know, a degree in science. You can, you, know, you can get jobs. You can get good, stable, well-paying jobs and have good lives. I get to set my own schedule. I gave that whole list of things that I do every day, um, but I get to choose what I want to do on any given day. You know, if I don't feel like reading any papers that day, I won't do it. If I feel like spending a whole day reading papers, you know, after teaching or something, then I do that. Um, that's both the good and the bad of the job, actually, that uh, there's so much to do that, you know, I have to actually decide, and I always feel like I'm not doing all the right things. But, you know, aside from that, I, it's wonderful being able to choose what you want. Um, I find physics, you know, and the science is surprisingly social. I mean, if you look at you, the faculty around you, they tend to talk to each other a lot, right? They talk about teaching, they talk about research, they go to conferences, they go to workshops, they go to events. It's, it's a nice community of people who are interested in the same thing. I find that a really nice place to work. Um, and finally, I travel. To me, I, I really en I enjoy traveling. Um, I, you, know, there's, you can go on many, many trips. There's lots of conferences and workshops and seminars all over. I mean, this year, I, I limited travel this year because I have an infant daughter, so I went on, on actually 12 trips, which are my limited travel, including New York and DC. I'm going to France this summer. I turned down trips to Moscow, Barcelona, South Africa, Egypt, just this year. And believe me, that was really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sacrifice for family, but uh, you know you actually get to explore the world and and meet people in your community around the world. So so these are sort of things that that that, that I really like um, about about what I do. Okay, so how did I get here, and what advice do I have? I hope that was some motivation that 
that inspires it tells you that, you know, this is sort of a good place to be. Right? <laughs> um, you know, it's a good field to be in. And so, you know, how do, how do you get to a place like this? Um, well, I'm going to go on now into something of my personal background of my career trajectory. Um, and I'd just like to put it in some framework of just, I thought about what advice do I have? What are the general things that I've sort of tried to consistently think about in my life? And I've limited them to four things here. Uh, the first one is just work hard. I, I feel like I've always worked really hard. There's no substitute for hard work, right? If something, if something is difficult for you, you have a choice of working harder at it or trying to do something that's easier. Um, and you know, I remember when I was in, in the seventh grade, I was taking an advanced math class. You know, it was a year ahead of me for the seventh grade. And was, I remember this distinctly, it was really hard. And I went home and I said, mom, it's too hard. I'm, I, you know, I'm getting a C in this class. I don't like it, it's hard for me. I don't wanna do it anymore. And she said, I'd rather see you get a C in this class than an A in an easier class. You can do this and you have to just try. And it was a really pivotal moment for me because I realized that I was only limited by how hard I was willing to work to realize what potential I truly had. Right? If you're not willing to work hard, you're never, not gonna see your potential. And that's really key for a lot of what you do. So hard work. Uh, try to do what most interests you. Uh, again, these are sort of related. You're willing to work hard at something that's interesting, right? It's much easier to work hard at something that you like than something you don't like. The key word here is what most interests you. Not what interests you all the time. Nothing's gonna be, you know, very rarely is something gonna be always interesting. But what's interesting a lot of the time, enough to keep you motivated. Uh, be yourself, but always be professional. Don't, you don't need to change yourself to, to go into a field like the sciences where maybe you don't feel like you have a lot of role models or mentors or people like you. If you find yourself in a situation, you're one of the few. Um, you don't need to be like everyone else around you. You can be yourself. And I have a caveat, always be professional, right? Look around you. You know, you do need to socialize with the people you work with. You do need to fit in somehow. You do need to keep a professional demeanor all the time. And that's, you know, really crucial for all these fields. And, and finally, I, throughout life, I consistently ask myself, am I comfortable with the worst case scenario? Right? I mean, let's say that you're thinking of going to graduate school and you don't know whether you should go to graduate school or to get a job. Okay, how do you decide that? Well, okay, if you go to graduate school and you don't like it, what's the worst that's going to happen? Well, then you get a job. You're back where you were before. It's not that bad, right? Um, if you, if you, uh, I had another example. I forgot it. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, but there, there, are lot, there are lots of cases like that where, where you could imagine where it seems like a very stressful choice, right? You're not sure, you know, do I take this job? Do I take that job? What career path do I take? Choose the one that you think is best for yourself. Think to yourself, what's the worst case that's gonna happen, you know? And, you know, in my case, you know, do I have kids before tenure? Do I wait till afterwards? And then and maybe I won't get tenure at all. Well, you know, in the worst case in that case, you know, if I, if I wait until tenure, then I don't have kids at all. I wasn't happy with that, right? And if I do it before tenure, then maybe I won't get tenure. That's okay if that's the worst case. You know, think to yourself, what's the worst that'll happen? And you'll realize it's not that bad. Just sort of go for what you want to do in that case. Okay, so those are my four bits of advice. I'm just gonna go on a little bit into more pictures of me <laughs> and, uh, and, and my background. So you've already heard of an outline of this. Uh, I was born in New York City, uh, lived in DC, uh, DC through ninth grade. I was in Houston for a few years. Um, I was, I was sort of, uh, I was always interested in math science. I was also just a big jock in, in grade school and in high school. I did, I did gymnastics very seriously at an elite level. I worked in Bella Caroli's gym. Um, after that, I, uh, I, did, uh, I ran track. I was high school track captain. I ran seven or eight events, I think. Um, you know, it, it, I, think that, I think that sports, things like that, it's okay to follow your interest in other areas. And in my case, things like sports were really good at keeping me focused, at, at keeping, reminding me, you know, keeping focused, taught perseverance, the importance of hard work. In fact, I remember in college, I, I ran track for a year and then I thought, oh, this is keeping me away from my studies. I really shouldn't run, I should just do research. And then of course I filled in the time after that, just for, you know, I didn't, when I ran, I was so organized. I was like, you know, at the gym and I was doing my homework and doing all these things. And when I quit, I just, I don't know what I did. I just wasn't organized. <laughs> I wasn't in shape either, so it's worst case, right? So, you know, you can do other things. Although, I should say at lunch today, I heard from a young man I, who's maybe here um, that in high school he, uh, he ran, he did five different sports events, five different sports like football and basketball and track and something else. You can do too much. <laughs> so just be aware that you don't want to take away from your studies, but it's okay to do other things. Um, 
I, uh, I was always interested in math and science. I used to do math word books for fun, sort of SAT sort of questions. I had a lot of support from my parents and some teachers in, in this, not everyone. I didn't have a strong physics background in high school. I didn't even have a, that strong a science background in high school. I just liked it. Uh, one of the key things for me was a summer internship in a biochemistry lab. I think you can see me there when I was a junior in high school. Um, uh, from that experience, I realized that I I didn't like biochemistry at all, but I really liked experimental science. <laughs> so uh, the pipettes and stuff, I don't know. Any chemistry, biochem people here? Someone, to, yeah, no, no, it's just, just not for me. That's all <laughs> it was You have to, you know, beakers and stuff. I don't, I don't know. So, um, but I really liked working in a lab. And so that was, you know, I, I'll go on to summer experiences and stuff, but just that experience in a lab was a big motivator, realizing I could do something that was fun and that I liked uh, with my life. Uh, Okay, so I went to college after that. Um, at that point, I knew that I wanted to do experimental science. I thought I did. I wasn't sure what area to go into. I mean, once again, I, I'm, I, try to, I try to work against the stereotype that everyone who goes on in science knew from high school, you know, had a really strong science background in high school and knew they wanted to be a chemistry PhD and go on into academia from the time they were five and they went right into college doing that. That's not usually the case, I don't think. Right? I sort of knew I liked science. I didn't know what I liked best. So I just took a lot of courses. I took freshman year math, chemistry, physics, biology, right? And just saw what happened. And it turned out that you know, bio was sort of interesting. Chemistry I didn't like so much until we got to the, uh, to the, to the atomic shells. That was really cool, the physical chemistry. Right? And, and physics was cool all the way through. So that sort of made up my mind that physics the way that you understand things in physics was a way that I wanted to understand the world, that, that appealed to me. So you guys can find your own things that appeal to you in the way you want to think about the world. But it's nice to just look around and try to find, try to find these things. Uh, you know, physics wasn't easiest for me. Again, it wasn't the field that I felt like I could go into and just get all A's right away. It was interesting, and I knew I liked to work in it. I liked experimental science, but it wasn't the thing that was really easy. In fact, it was hard. You know, science is hard, especially in college. Um, you know, I remember one time when I was in college and I spent an all-nighter at the physics library, you know, doing a problem set, a really hard problem set, and I was there until three in the morning, maybe six or seven hours just working on this thing, and I dragged myself home. I remember walking through the quad, and I was going back to my dorm, and there are these bright lights in one of the dorms that I passed by, and I sort of looked in like a deer in headlight thing, and I saw these guys, it was a Tuesday night, right? These guys playing pool and drinking beer. And I thought, they're not physics majors. <laughs> you know? You know? I bet they're not in the sciences at all. <laughs> they're living differently from me. <laughs> they're not doing this. And it wasn't an unpleasant thing. It was just you realize that there are differences. You know, I was working harder at that point than they were. It was harder for me. Um, and you have to think long term. You know, at the end of the day, they wanted to do something different from what I wanted to do. You know, maybe they wanted to go on to business school, or maybe they had parents who are wealthy. I don't know, right? But if I wanted to take my path, I had to be willing to accept that I was working harder, that it was going to be unfun sometimes. Um, that that I had to work now to, have pay, to pay off in the longer term. And just remember that when you're slogging through these things in college, it's a long-term thing. Don't be, I mean, you can be discouraged now, but don't let that change your mind about what you're doing. Right? Don't let the threat of hard work or seems, you know, other people having easier time make decisions for you now. Uh, and then the other thing uh, is, uh, oh, I, I did want to say one more thing is that, uh, Ah, never mind. So the other thing is just, again, try to, think, try to figure out what's fun to think about, what you like best most of the time. And again, I've highlighted most of the time because the other sort of fallacy that I realized is that, you know, I used to go to talks like you and people would come up here and, and give, you know, these, these uh, sort of motivational talks and they'd say, I'm so passionate about my field. I've always wanted to be a physicist. It's my great love and my great passion. And I would sit in the audience and think, well, I'm not that passionate about it. Maybe I shouldn't be here. You know, it, I think you do find people who are very, very passionate about what they do all the time. But those people are extremely fortunate and extremely rare. Right? The rest of us pretty much like what we do a lot of the time. <laughs> not all the time. Maybe not even 70%, you know, maybe 65% of the time <laughs> we really like what we do. And the rest, it can be sort of hard or just okay. So if you find you know, what you like to do 
think about what you'd like to think about most of the time, that's a pretty good thing, right? You're doing pretty well. You don't have to have it be the, you know, the light of your life to, to go on in the field. And again, if you think about other jobs, right, doing something you like most of the time is a pretty good thing. So, so keep that in mind. And the thing I mentioned before is what was really pivotal for me in college, what actually got me through these sort of hard problem sets and hard times, was experience doing the thing that I really liked, which was working in the lab. Um, I did summer internships starting from my junior year in high school all the way through graduate school. Right? Four or five, I did five of these things. I worked at, you know, at the biochemistry lab at Rice University. I worked at Exxon Production Research when I lived in Houston. Um, I worked at General Atomics doing plasma physics in San Diego. I worked at AT&T Bell Labs for several summers in New Jersey. Um, these were just fantastic opportunities to, to get hands-on experience, to, to, to see role models, to get mentors. A lot of these programs were specifically targeted for women or minorities, so it was a really good peer group of people like me who maybe you know, didn't expect to be where they were, but were succeeding, were, were, were challenging themselves, were trying to do well, who were supporting each other. Um, you know, again, you get to see the fun of real research versus classwork. You know, I, I, it, gets you, it allows you to think about what area of your field that you're interested in. So I, I really strongly encourage. I mean, in fact, how many, of, how many of the undergrads here have done summer research? Anyone? Okay, good. So I'm going to push this thing. <laughs> it's really important. You can do it at your own university, right? You can stay here for the summer and work with someone, I think. There are opportunities for that, right? Get some hands-on experience. Get to know your professors even better. Get to work with other students. There are RUs across the country. These are really key. It gives you experience. It allows you to see what's fun outside of the classroom, right? I mean, like me in biochemistry, you may not like the specific thing you're working on, but it gives you a sense of what you do like. It's really important, really fun. For me, it was crucial, and I strongly encourage you to get your own experiences. Okay, where am I? And then I went to graduate school. So at first I had this slide as I went to graduate school talking about it, then I realized, well, this is not really an obvious choice, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you are thinking about graduate school, but it's, it's a choice you have to make at some point. So, I thought I'd put here a few reasons why you might want to think about advanced degrees in the sciences. I, I hope I've shown you why you definitely want to stay in your field and work hard and graduate and do as well as you can. And then you might wanna, may want to consider an advanced degree. I mean, honestly, in the sciences, advanced degrees are really crucial to getting a stable job, right? It's, it's you know, as you know, the economy is not so robust right now. Um, it's, it's really a key to, to being able to do something to get, it's a really a key to having more choices in life. Okay, if you get an advanced degree, you will have more job opportunities, many more than you would otherwise. Okay, you will also be able to delve deeply into your field. So advanced degrees are crucial, I think, to a stable, well-paid, really interesting positions. You know, with a BA in engineering, you can, you know, do research and development on something specific that someone tells you what to do. With a PhD in engineering, you can choose your own research line within a company and be their development person, right? That's the difference in these things. Um, I did think of other professional schools. I thought if I wanted to go to law school or medical school or business school, again, they just didn't stimulate me intellectually in the same way, didn't have the lifestyle that I wanted. Um, and I also just wanted to research. I liked research. I wanted to learn about my field, wanted to get advanced training. It's a great chance to sort of be paid, not very much, but be paid <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to learn, to think, right, to be in an academic environment. So, uh, so here's my, my pros and cons of grad school here. It's intellectually stimulating. Again, it's very flexible. You can, you, can, you, know, you can go on vacation in the middle of the week if you really want to. Um, it's an academic community, which is a very, you know, that's a thoughtful, good community to be in. And a PhD is powerful, right? Once you have a PhD, it's something no one takes away from you. You can do a lot with that. Um, the cons is it's a lot of work, <laughs> again. It's relatively low pay. I mean, you know, you're not expected to make a lot of money, so I think it's okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you want to make tons right away, it's, it's hard. Um, it's not easy to be intellectually challenged all the time. You know, it's another five years of thinking a lot all the time, right? So you have to be ready, mentally prepared for that. And, you know, maybe you're tired of the ivory tower. Um, I'll say more about this later. I think there are ways of finding support groups and finding life outside of grad school that can combat all of these cons. And for me, I found it definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. And I think for most people, if you're ready to work and if you're interested in what you do, um, it's a really good way to go. Okay, so, so I went to graduate school at Stanford. There's a campus, it was pretty. So I, I chose to go there partly because it was sort of cushy and I knew I'd be working really hard so I didn't wanna have to deal with snow. Um, 
<laughs> not that you know, it doesn't you could you could make your own choices, but I <laughs> that was my decision. It was a good it was a good department. Uh, my PhD was on superconductor metal insulator transitions in 2D. I worked on two-dimensional superconductors. Again, I chose to focus on condensed matter experiment, mostly because that's what I had really good experiences in summer research in. So um, I wanted to continue to learn about that field and to try to contribute to that area. Uh, what do I want to say about grad school? Uh, you can ask me more questions about grad school. I just want to say you can have a you can have a decent life in grad school. I had a, I had a good time in grad school, in, in retrospect, partly. But <laughs> even at the time, it was it was good. I I, you know, I met my husband in grad school. I, I joined a dance troupe. I uh, you know I, I hung out with friends. I I worked in a lab. I got a lot done. It was it was a good experience. It was a good experience. It was not, you know, it was it was five and a half, almost six years of my life, and they were good years. I learned a lot. I had fun. It's not a bad thing. Uh, okay, so then I, I did a postdoc at Harvard after that. I, I do mention that I, I chose to go back to Boston. Um, at that point, um, I was, well, I had a fiance, and, uh, and we chose Boston based on his job. He wanted to go back to school, and I'll come back to this later about you know how you work with your partner in academia and these sort of things, but he had waited for me for three years to graduate from, to get my PhD. Uh, we both knew that I'd be looking for academic jobs. Those were hard to get, so this was his chance to choose to do what he wanted to do, and I was going to be flexible. It's really good to work together with someone if you know that these things are coming up to balance. If you have a partner or family considerations, any of those things, think in advance about how to make it work best for you, know, you as a family, not just you. So um, we actually went back to Boston because he wanted to go to graduate school there. Um, and then I found a postdoc there afterwards. It ended up, worked out really well for me, but that was, that was why we went back there. Uh, so I did a postdoc at Harvard for one year. I was elected to the Society of Fellows there, which is a, uh, a, uh, it, it's a fellowship that gives you three years funding for independent research, which is really wonderful, and you have these fancy dinners once a week. So my husband called it um, a, 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 a social reward for people who spent college working too hard. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was basically, <laughs> that was actually really wonderful. Um, and then I spent, took about six months off and had my first daughter, and she's there in a bunny suit, I think. Um, and, then I, uh, and then I joined the faculty at the University of Illinois. Um, I did, even after my postdoc, I did think a little bit about other jobs I might want to take. I considered working at a, um, at an, a research job in industry. Um, that's, I guess that's all I really thought about. <laughs> um, but you know, those, those weren't quite as flexible in terms of doing things that I wanted to do as, as an academic job was. And once again, I thought, well, I'm interested in the research. You know, I like the academic lifestyle. I've heard sort of scary things about, about how hard people work, they can't have families, they can't do this. But again, what's the worst that's gonna happen? Let me try to do my best, right? Let me try to do the things that I want to do in the best way I can, in the most organized way, you know, prioritizing things in my life, and then see what happens. You know, if it doesn't work out, then I have a PhD in physics. I'll get a job, right? It's not going to be terrible. If it does work out, then that's great. You know, again, what's the worst that'll happen? So, so it, it's working out fine so far. You know, there's, it's fine, right? You know, I'm, I'm happy. So, uh, so, so sometimes when I, you know, if someone, I've had people look at my resume and say, oh, you were physics in college, and then you did a postdoc in physics, and you're on the faculty in physics, and that was really clear, good for you. You know, and I just want to say, you know, was this, this wasn't always such, it's not really, in my mind, it didn't feel like a really clear path. It wasn't the sort of thing where I felt like I was just railroaded on this path, and physics, 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 all I want to do, now I'm here, and that's great. You know, you can do it too. It wasn't always obvious to me that, that, I, would, that, I, would go on in, that I would go on in physics, that I'd make the choices that I did. Um, Again, you know, I, 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 I tried to sort of do what I wanted to do and follow my worst case scenario rule. You know, if I don't like, if I, you know, did I want to go to med school or did I want to go to grad school? Well, if I went to med school, it's really hard to go back to grad school when you take a few years off, right? It takes a really concerted effort, you know, to do those problem sets again. It's really unlikely that you'll go to med school for three years and go back to grad school. On the other hand, it's a little more likely that if you don't like grad school, you can still go to medical school, right? Those are things that, you know, that sort of made sense to me. Let me try grad school, see if I like it, I'm interested in it, see what happens. If it doesn't work out, I have other choices. What's the worst that'll happen, you know? Uh, so, you know, every choice along the way was I thought about carefully, 
and, uh, and ended up where I am. You know, did, did I always want a career in physics? Um, no, I mean, at some point in college, I remember, you know, again, physics, it was, it was sort of hard. I don't want to keep saying this hard. It's not always hard. <laughs> it's, it's sometimes you know, it's, it's fun. It can be good. But, I, you know, at some point I was just, I wasn't so enthusiastic. I wasn't excited about the problem sets I was doing. I didn't like a lab course. I wasn't sure. I saw my friends doing really fun things, anthropology. I wanted to switch to anthro or history. Um, and, uh, you know, and, you know, I was discouraged by my parents, which is a good thing <laughs> I'm doing that. And also, like I said, I had these really good summer experiences. I knew that I liked to work in physics. I knew that there was something beyond the problem set that would be fun. Um, and, and I decided just to, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to, to, to get a different sort of job with a physics degree than it is to get a different sort of job. I mean, I, I, it's a lot easier for me to get a job that I like with a physics degree than to get a job that I like with an anthro degree, <laughs> I realize. And so I, I, I stayed in it. And I thought, I'll just you know, keep working hard, try to stay interested, and see what happens. And, and that was a. Uh, that was a good thing. Um, as you mentioned, I also felt like, like I had something to contribute to physics. And you know, as, a, as a minority in physics, you know, as you're a minority or a woman, the numbers are very small, right? And, and you, you can recognize that you, know, you can be a role model, right? When the numbers are small, even adding one person in the field can make a big difference. So you're in sort of a unique position. And I think that's a good thing, right? It, 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 you know, it's sort of, to me, it's a, it's a motivator, right? There's something unique about my position now that may not be as unique if I were you know, in medicine or in business or something like that. So if I like it, and if I feel like I have something a little bit special to contribute, to me it's important, right? You guys, I think, have something special to contribute as well, a little beyond what maybe everyone else does. And let that be a motivator to you. That's, it's a good thing to be unique, to have something other people don't have, to be able to be a role model that is really lacking in the field, okay? And that's, that's, that's good, right? That's motivation, at least for me it was. Um, was I, am I always excited or interested in my fields? I said, no, it's not always, you know, my favorite thing in the world, but, um, you know, I'm excited a lot of the time. It's interesting and it's fun. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's good enough for me. So am I now happy with the choices I've made? I think, yes, I am, right? And if I'm not, then I'll make other choices, right? Um, you know, the world is, is open. Okay, so I'm just gonna end with a little section on what I think are some of the special challenges of being a woman or a minority in scientists, and then we can just open up the floor. Um, I've listed four things that just came off the top of my head, and I'll go through them one by one. Um, the big thing, I think, is a lot of us underestimate ourselves, right? It's, it's a, I have a picture here. There have been, there's been research showing that if you mark your race or gender down on a test, in the sciences or a field where you're underrepresented, you do worse. Just marking that box lowers your test score, right? We're underestimating ourselves. We're thinking that we don't belong here, that we're not going to do well, and therefore we do worse. That's a really, it's a really serious challenge and problem, right? To think that we don't belong. And so what do you do? So the answer is you do belong, right? You can do really well. This is the area that you should be in if you want to be here. Right? How do you prove that to yourself? Well, fun one, you find role models. This is a wonderful group that you're in right now. You, know, you have speakers coming in who can be role models. Be role models to each other as well. Right? Look around you. Right? Look at everyone else doing what you're doing. It's really important to see that you're all trying to get to the same place. Right? And, and if you look at, your other, look at your friends, you realize that they're really great and excellent. They deserve to be where they are. They should be where they are, and you should too. Um, work hard. Right? I keep a... I, I keep saying this. Um, sometimes it's easy to underestimate yourself if you think that something is too hard for you, right? If you find something challenging, if you feel like other people are getting the problem sets faster than you, then maybe you don't belong where you are. No, it means you just have to work harder on those problem sets, right? <laughs> you know, I've. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I remember when I was in, in college that there were some kids who'd come in with every, you know, they were taking graduate school classes as sophomores, and, and I wasn't doing that, and they were so much better than me, and did I belong where I was? And, you know, a few years later, these same people, you know, they, they'd sort of lost interest. They didn't really want to work around the lab. They weren't doing their thing, and I was pushing ahead at that point because I was really excited about my field, right? You can't tell by comparing yourself to other people. Do your work, you know? Keep pushing yourself. If you don't feel like you're doing well, work a little harder. You know, you'll get to where you want, where you should be. Don't think less of yourself because of that. Just work harder. And judge yourself on results. You know, the beautiful thing about math science is that there's actual results. You can circle the answer, right? 
you know, base base what you do on on, on your answers, on, on on your on your grades, and how you feel, and how you're interested, on what people tell you, you know, not on any misconceptions that you or others have. Uh, I mean, I remember at some point, I remember in graduate school, I, I took we had this, this two-day written qualifying exam. There was all these problems on physics. It was eight hours a day over two days. I have to answer, the, you know, in, on, you know in, in sitting on a desk, answering these things. And, um, and I thought I'd failed it. So after the second day, I went home, and I threw myself in my bed, and I was crying. And I called my mom, and I said, you know, I failed my qualifying exam. I'm leaving physics. I started making plans. You know, what else am I going to do? Where am I going to apply? I'm not, I, don't, I shouldn't be a physicist anymore. You know, I just don't, I'm not good at this. And uh, you know, four days later, the scores were posted, and I'd passed. And I just went back to the lab, and it was fine. Right? <laughs> and and I realized at that point that was just silly, right? I was letting my perception of myself be based on a test that I thought that I hadn't done well on. Even if I hadn't done well on that test, I was still the same person, right? I should have based it on what I knew that I was good at, on what I could do, not on what I thought, you know, some perception of where I belonged. Okay, the other problem is being underestimated. Again, being one of the few, you know, you're looked at differently. You're gonna be judged a little bit more harshly, right? Everyone, you're gonna be noticed in your classes, right? <laughs> Teachers are gonna notice if you do really badly, if you do really well. Um, you know, people are not going to expect you to necessarily do well at first. Um, and all I can say is, again, just do your work. You know, you circle the answer and that's the, you know, that, that's the answer no matter what people think of you. Okay, stay professional. Uh, if you find someone who you don't think is supporting you, maintain a professional relationship and find role models elsewhere. Okay, they're not your problem. Uh, you know, find outside support. Find groups like this. Find other groups of peer mentors, of other mentors, uh, people who you know will, will will respect you and understand your your true potential. Um, I think my. Uh, my picture here is of Obama. This is, you know, ho hopefully in the future, you know, people won't underestimate <laughs> us quite so much. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, in, in the time being, especially this field, it's something that happens that you just have to try not to think about, do what you can do, find your support and role models, and do your work. Okay. Uh, the other thing is loneliness. Again, you may find that you're the only person of color in your class, right? You're the only woman in your entire physics class. You know, you have, I remember in graduate school, I used to joke with my friends, we were both trying to meet, you know, all male grad students. We said we were, we were all trying to meet women, right? Like, I just wanted friends, you know? <laughs> and so, <laughs> you, know, you, may, you may find you're one of the only ones there. And, and again, find, find outside support. I, have, I go to the National Conference of Black Physicists, Black and Hispanic Physicists every year. And, and now I have, I've gone for the past 10 years. Now I have a, you know, friends there. We meet every year. We go out for dinner and for drinks. It's a lot of fun. We support each other. I know what they're doing. I know that they're good. They know that I'm good. I have a community that's just supportive. It's really rejuvenating. Um, I have another set of friends like that in, this me in the Mellon Fellowship that I got as an undergraduate. These are people who are just immensely important to me for keeping just a peer network of, of excellent people who I know support me, who I know are rooting for me, who are also trying to be role models to succeed in their field. Um, I strongly encourage you to find people like this. You know, you meet them every three months and just rejuvenate yourself, get some support up again, and then go back to where you have to be. Uh, and the last challenge is, as I mentioned, just balancing family and career. I mean, especially, I know a lot of women who are in physics uh, worry about not going into the field or in the sciences, uh, don't want to go into the field because they think they can't have families, they can't spend time with their kids, uh, they don't want to do it. And um, I should say that, you know, the sciences, especially, you know, academia is, is not, it's actually easier, I think, to have a family in academia than it is if you're a lawyer or a doctor or a professional in some sort. It's just that, it's so flexible in terms of schedule that you always feel guilty about how much time you're spending in any one place because you're deciding, right? So if you decide to spend, you know, five hours with your kids one day and not work, then, you know, then if you don't get the work done, it's your fault. Or if you decide to spend all day at work and not see your kids, then it's your fault again. It's not like your boss is telling you to do it. So I think that's why people, to me, that's why people stress about it so much more. But, you know, in, in that case, my picture of me and my kids. Um, you know, in that case, you just have to be hyper-organized, you know, plan everything. I, uh, you know, I had both kids in the winter because then I got the spring semester and the summer off. You know, their birthdays were December 30th and January 19th. That was not a coincidence, okay? <laughs> you know? Okay, I'm a hyper-planning person, but it's good. It helps, right? I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to give you all the... But it's true. You really, I mean, if you want these things to work to the best of your ability, make, create circumstances that work, that, that allow you to do what you want to do, you know? 
uh, you know, make sure you have a sense of your priorities. Like I said, I decided to have two kids before tenure because I really wanted children. I didn't want to wait until I was 40. And uh, if it hurts tenure, then it hurts tenure. But that was a priority of mine. And I think it's, it's going OK so far. Um, this picture here in DC is when, when my, my second daughter was a month and a half old, uh, I was required to go to DC for a, for a big grant meeting. I didn't know, so I'm a, turn, I'm a month and a half, I didn't want to go. And I said, fine, I'll go if you pay for my babysitter to come with me. And so there's me and the, had a day off, and we went to the, the monument, and, <laughs> and that was it. You, know, you just try to make things work for yourself, and it can hopefully work out. Okay, so, so that's it. Uh, four bits of advice I've tried to follow my whole life, work hard. Um, I forgot to mention that my, my aunt always says, you know, she says to me, it's funny, the harder you work, the luckier you become. <laughs> right? Work hard. Uh, try to do what most interests you. Be yourself. Always be professional. And ask yourself, are you comfortable the worst case scenario? For me, keeping these things in mind has, has seemed to work out. And if it doesn't, what's the worst that'll happen? <laughs> Not so bad, usually. Thanks for listening. Open to any questions that you have. I can keep talking, but you probably don't want that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have undergraduates, yeah. I've, I've almost always had two or three undergraduates working in my lab during the year and during the summer. Um, I, I really, I like working with undergraduates because for me, as I said, undergraduate research was really key to, to forming, you know, to getting experience and learning about what I liked in, in the field, and I, I want to, I think it's important for undergraduates to have that same opportunities in my lab. Um, so, uh, so many professors will have, will, will work with undergraduate and ask them, and the key is making sure that you work in a lab that, or that you work somewhere where there's a, an actual project for you. Now, I admit, when I first hired, I've hired freshmen just to, you know, organize, to, to <laughs> literally organize screws and hardware in the lab. Right, they're freshmen. I pay them for the summer, and they go in. And if I need some, you know, labor done, like soldering or just putting things in their place, I'll have them do that. And then from there, we'll work up to, you know, if they if first summer they they organize, and during the year maybe they do some soldering, and then the next year they do some real research, and the following year they do a thesis project. Right, we sort of work their way through. So even if they have no previous experience, they can work around the lab. They can see what's going on. They can see if they're interested. They can start building up some hands-on ability, and then really take off when they're doing their real research. And so I try to think of projects like that to start people, hopefully, usually their freshman or sophomore year and continue through their senior years. <laughs> it, it takes a lot. Um, so um, each student costs about uh, $45,000, but that's, let's see, uh, so each, well, each student costs about 25000 but then there's overhead on top of that. So the overhead is 50%, so it's about 50000 for a student um, or, or more. It's going up all the time. <laughs> uh, typical, a typical grant from the NSF might be about 100000 but then you have to take out supplies. You, know, you can't just have a student work there without having money to do their research. Right? So it takes 30000 to do research. Usually you get a little bit of salary or something else out of there. So you can support one student with each grant usually. So I have, I have three different grants. Oops, I don't want that to happen. Um, I, have, I have two pretty large grants and one, one other grant. Uh, and I just got another grant to support a postdoc and some startup money. So I have about, uh, how much do I have per year? Uh, 150, 300, 400, about $400,000 in grant money per year, um, which is not quite enough. So, I, so to support my postdoc, I dip a little bit into my startup. Um, so the, four, the four, 400, 450,000 supports about, well, so we'll support about five students plus half a postdoc. And we do a lot of fabrication. I think I mentioned these nanoscale things. That's really expensive to use those facilities. And also to do things at low temperatures, at liquid helium temperatures is very expensive as well. So um, I was very fortunate my first year, I got a couple of grants, but you do have to keep, you know, to keep this level of students, you have to write a lot of grants every year. <laughs> so, yeah, that's very nice. But you know, it, I didn't think I wanted such a big group, but then I had a lot of ideas and I didn't want to take people off other projects. And so you just keep adding people and keep adding people and it's out of control and I don't know, you know, I don't know, I don't know where they all came from, honestly. They just appeared in the lab and they're doing good work. I'm happy they're there, but they just, they keep coming. <laughs> So, so who here is interested in graduate school? 
<laughs> what else? What else do you guys want to do? What is? What are your? Uh, what are you interested in doing when you graduate? Yeah, you. Okay, good. How about you? Everyone looks away. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, I'll take another question. Yeah. Did you? Did you? Were you gonna say something? Yeah. In, in uh, physics, I, I was the only African American woman getting a physics PhD in 2001, I believe. I didn't know. It was funny. I I didn't. I mean, you don't know. You're just working. And again, you you just work. You do your stuff. I mean, that's, again, science is sort of nice that way. You know, you can be one of the few. You can do whatever. But at the end of the day, you have to get your papers out. Right? So you can talk all you want about being a double minority or anything else. But all that matters at the end of the day is do you have some publications? Have you given some talks? And have you written your thesis? You know? I mean, you have to get to that point. So at that point, I was just very involved in my work. I had no idea. And it was only, I think it was two years later, I was attending a talk. And it was a talk on minorities in physics. And the speaker said, you know, the numbers are so small. In fact, in the year 2001, there was only one black woman who got a PhD in physics. And I said, that's me. <laughs> so that's how I knew. <laughs> so, <laughs> and now I use that in talks. So that's, I, don't, actually, I, mean, I tried to look it up. I think it's a true fact. That's what he said at any rate. So, yeah, but I, you don't know. I mean, you know, for all of, for all of us, you, know, you, you do know in your local environment that you're one of the few. And like I said, you find mentors and, and, and peers. And I should mention, it doesn't mean that you don't hang out with your own lab group or the people that you work with. I mean, that's also really crucial. It's not, you know, it, it's okay to have two sets of friends, right? It's okay to have people that you work with who you're, you know, you're sort of your friends with, you go out with, you go to lunch with, you do stuff with, and have another set of friends you hang out with differently. That's okay, a lot of, a lot of us do it, right? It's not okay to just not hang out at all with people at work and only have your other friends who don't interact with anything you're working with. I think that that's, that's dangerous, right? Because a, a lot of professional activities happen informally. It also makes your life less fun when you're at work, right? You should find people who you get along with and you can interact with and try to make relationships with them. Um, and then you don't feel, you know, then, so you don't feel like you're the only one or lonely because you have people in different places you can, you can hang with, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great. That's a great question. Um, so, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a not a secret. It's, it's a fact that people, many people, surprisingly, don't know about that. Um, at least in this, in the pure sciences, like in chemistry or math or physics, you're paid to go to grad school. You don't pay. You get a stipend. They paid me to learn about my field and get an advanced degree. Now they didn't pay me very much, but they paid me. <laughs> okay, so something at the level of you know, $18,000 a year or something like that. I could live, it was enough to live in the dorms, you know, to buy the food that I wanted to go to buy, to go on a few trips every year, to, you know, buy a used car and head up to Yosemite with my friends, right? So, so that's a really important thing. And when you, typically when you're getting a, P, for a PhD, you're usually paid a stipend. Now, um, in the sciences, that stipend comes out of, your, out of your professor's grants. That was a question about how much grant money I needed. My grant money pays for the students. Um, in the humanities, the, typically the, the students will have to teach to pay for, to pay for their um, degrees. Um, but in, in these fields, you're paid. You know, you can, it's, it's nice change from, co from college, actually. Um, I did have loans in college, um, and I, uh, I paid back those loans. You, know, you don't have to pay them back while you're still in school. So you, they only become due at some you know, gradual rate after you've graduated from graduate school. And at that point, as a postdoc, um, you know, it's standard in physics, standard postdoc salaries are 40,000, 45,000 now, right? And that's enough to at least pay off a monthly loan until you're faculty and you can pay back more, or you know, until you get a job and you can pay back more. So um, you can get loans, and uh, typically the loans don't come due until you have a job, right? Uh, now, if you go to a professional school, you do have to pay for that, right? If you go to optometry school or if you want to get a master's in engineering, for example, you pay for that. But then the first job you get in those fields are usually pretty high paying, right? So if you can swallow paying some interest for a few years, after four or five years, I suspect your salary will be high enough that you can pay back those loans relatively easily, okay? So um, it's scary to owe a lot of money. It really is. But you have to understand that, you know, over the, do just do the calculation. 
figure out what your salary will be if you get an advanced degree versus what you don't and figure out how much, you know, subtract the amount for the loans and look at the difference. You'll definitely get out, not only get out ahead financially, but you'll have a better job, <laughs> something more interesting. That's why people do it. If it didn't make sense, you wouldn't see people going into these fields, right? You wouldn't see smart people doing it, right? They're worried about the same thing you are and they've done that calculation. Yes. Yes. Right. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, and the answer is yes. In fact, the same conference is a joint student and professional conference. Um, which I find great because it allows students to go to talks by professionals and us to be there to help mentor the students. So um, that's something that there's just, you could actually go on the web, the National, like, National Conference of, of Black and Hispanic Physicists, and they pay for students to go to the conference. You don't pay out of pocket. They will fly you out there and put you in a hotel and you know, pay for you to go to the conference for four days. Okay? You have to register and you have to, you, know, you have to be one of the first to register for it, but there's hundreds of students who go there who are paid to do this sort of thing. So these are things you just need to find out about. You know, ask faculty, ask them. This is why, I hope why someone like me is here, <laughs> to tell you that these things exist. Um, I don't know if it exists for, for chemistry. I do know that some math graduate students have come to the conference. You know, they've sort of sneaked their way in because <laughs> the hard sciences, <laughs> material science people have snuck their way in too, right? You just have to get a recommendation, I think, from a faculty member. Um, so this is a conference that, um, they pay for you to go, it's, it's an annual conference. There's many other students there and there are faculty. There are special sessions on you know, how to get into graduate school, you know, how to choose your field in physics, tutorials on the different areas, um, you know, homework tutorials, uh, you know, how to choose an advisor. Uh, and like I said, it's just, it's also, it's not you know, as important as all of these sessions, it's just being with other people, right? meeting these other students. Um, and I can actually give an example. I have, I currently have an African American graduate student who, when she came to graduate school, she, she wasn't happy about being labeled as a minority in physics. And I understand that, and I respected that. You know, she was a physicist first. You know, it wasn't that she was a woman, it wasn't that she was black, she was a physicist, and she wanted people to recognize that. She didn't want to take part in any of these organizations. She didn't want to go to the meeting. She felt like that was just pushing her into a stereotype that she didn't want to be in. And I understood that, and I respected that. But I think one of the other students finally convinced her to go because they said, you know, why don't you try this? It's a free trip. It's sort of fun, right? And she went, and lo and behold, she made friends, right? <laughs> she made friends there. She found a peer group. She made friends with the other graduate students from our department who went there. And she realized it wasn't that she was being pigeonholed into a stereotype, that there were just a bunch of physics nerds just like her who liked and supported each other. That was all there was, <laughs> right? And I, it, was, it's, it's been a, it was a great pleasure for me to see this year her organize the other students in attending the conference, right? Because it was just, it was a place where she found support. Um, and like I said, you can find it in lots of different places, and this is just one of those. So um, you can look online, National Conference of Black and Hispanic Physicists. I don't, you can see if there's one for chemistry, I can try to find that out, or for math. Um, but these things exist, and they're online. Um, and like I said, there are other... Um, fellowships and other things that you can look into. I had this Mellon Fellowship as an undergraduate that has a similar peer group actually from across academia. And I really value their friendship too. So you can find out these things. As, as in graduate school, you mean? Uh, yeah, undergraduate, I just looked at, um, so if you want to do research as an undergraduate, for these summer programs, I just, I applied pretty widely and just looked at, again, just looked to see what's interesting. I did one in plasma physics, right? I thought that was, it was sort of cool, you know, energy, they're trying to get the plasma reactor, fusion reactor to get, you know, this good energy source, and I thought that was just a really great idea, but then once I got in the field, I realized I'd been trying it for like 30 years, it never worked, and I wasn't that excited, so I don't know. Not that it's a bad field if you do it, I mean, it's just that for me, it wasn't that, <laughs> it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I just, like I said, I poked around on what was interesting for me for these summer programs. At, at my university, I worked um, for a couple semesters in a lab, and in that case, I, again, just looked on the websites. You know, people are pretty friendly. If you email them and say, I'm interested in working with you, they'll say yes or no. If they say yes, that's great. If they say no, 
you know, then they say no. I, you know, like I said, I, I advise undergraduates and I, uh, you know, I have, I tell all the students, go find an advisor. So I have a lot of students who come from the su Chicago suburbs and one of them said he wanted to go home. I said, okay, then just email faculty at University of Chicago and Northwestern, say who you are, send your, send your CV and say, can I work for you? And I said, and then just volunteer to work for free since you're living at home. Just do it. And he did it, and sure enough, he got into this great lab at Northwestern. The guy even paid him. He got a lot of research experience, and he was, it just all worked out. It, it doesn't always all work out, but if you, like I said, you, know, you just have to keep pushing it and see what happens. So, um, you know, so I did that sort of thing. I just emailed people. Um, in graduate school, again, I just, I actually, I came to graduate school to work with a certain professor. He was the reason I came to graduate school. I worked for a semester in his lab and realized I wasn't interested in switched groups. Yeah. <laughs> so you did the same thing. Is that, yeah. So you never know. Things don't work out always. And, you know, so you could have, I could have been depressed and thought, oh, I came here and it wasn't the person I wanted to do. But, you know, you, you should also make sure when you choose places, choose places with lots of options. You know, don't go to graduate school that has one professor you want to work with and no one else. You know, don't go to any sort of school that has one thing you want to do. It's really good in one area and terrible in everything else. Because, if you find out you don't want to do that one thing, you're sort of in trouble, right? Try to find a place that's a little bit broad. Try to find a school that has a couple people you're interested in, a couple things you may want to do, and then you have flexibility, right? So for me, I chose somewhere specifically that had three or four people that seemed interesting, and then I went and talked to those other people and it ended up working out, so. How do I feel? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're masking the minority label. I'd say that they're uh, uh, enhancing it. <laughs> you know, it's sort of, um, I, I, how, how, do I, so how do I feel? How do I feel? <laughs> I feel happy, you know. Um, uh, you know. Am I proud of myself, that sort of thing? Or do, how, do, how do you feel? Um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I feel, I feel lucky with, with having the opportunities that I've had, you know, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things, you know, that's, with many of us are sort of overachievers, I think, right? If you're in the sciences, you're probably an overachiever just at some level, right? You're not taking the easiest route. You're not just trying to make lots of money and do, you know, you know get out the door as fast as you can. You're doing something that's interesting and you're willing to work for it. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking ahead. I need to get a lot of experiments done in the lab, and my students need to get a lot of papers out, <laughs> and I need to get tenure and do a lot more work and build up some things. And so I guess I feel stressed and worried about doing all these big things in the future that I don't have time to do. <laughs> That's your running. But no, but seriously, I, I, you know, I, do, I do recognize the opportunities that I've had. I have felt very lucky in my life, and, and it's still important to me to make sure that other people just have opportunities. You know, I, I really strongly feel that it's not that, it's not that the sciences, that math and science is a better field to go into, right? It doesn't matter. If you're really interested in history, then by all means, do that. Right? If you really don't like what you're doing, then leave the field. Just do it for the right reasons. Right? If you leave the field, make sure you leave it because you're just not interested, not because you don't think you belong, not because you've been discouraged, not because it's hard, right? Those are bad reasons. You leave if you're not interested, otherwise you stay because you do belong, because you can work harder, because it's a good field to be in if you're interested, right? So I really think that if people have the encouragement and the opportunities, they can make the right choices, right? And I think we will see greater numbers in the field after that, when people realize, you know, okay, someone else has been there, I can do this too, and I want to do it. And if they stay in for that reason, that's a good one. You know, so, um, so like I said, I, it's, it, it is a motivator for me right now to feel like, I've gone through some of this and maybe I can show people that, you know, not just a role model, but I like where I am and you can have these opportunities, right? They're there for you too. <laughs> well, thanks guys.